everything. Yeah. In my ear. <laughs> I was looking, where is it? It's in my ear. Did you turn this on? Do I have to do everything for you? I was wondering why it was so loud, much louder tonight. It's because my ears are unplugging after a week of this cold. Yeah. When you were my enemy, I laid my son upon a Roman cross. Be kind and tender-hearted Comfort and help each other 
Okay. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles? Don't turn in your Bibles anywhere. We don't have to turn in your Bible anywhere right now at this particular time because we're doing the history of the English Bible. So uh, we're not going to be turning into our, in, in our Bibles anywhere at, at, as a, as a, at, uh, at this immediate point. So uh, we're going to be doing the fourth hour of the history of the English Bible. We, uh, uh, this is the history of the English Bible, not the Bible itself, the history of the English Bible. It's a seven-part series, and we're going to be noting uh, this evening, we're going to be moving into the, the era of the King James. And, uh, of course, uh, today, uh, because of the King James-only advocates, uh, uh, the King James has uh, come under fire, but uh, it actually, as I'll be pointing out, uh, that uh, it's a great translation and back in 1611 England. It was great English. It's a great masterpiece, actually. Uh, as we'll see, the King James translators uh, were more uh, inclined to get uh, an elegant translation, and that was the period that they lived in, uh, rather than accuracy. And then, as we'll see, when we get uh, into the modern translations, uh, like uh, the 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 NR the RSV, the New American Standard, they were looking for more accuracy rather than elegance. Of course. The whole thing is to do what Tyndale did, is get both. Be accurate and elegant in your translation. The tra King James has many uh, memorable uh, 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 phrases in it, and so it's a, it was a magnificent translation. But of course, we don't speak uh, the King's English like that anymore. Uh, as we, I brought in the Geneva Bible last night, and I'm showing Titus and the kids, and it's like, you know, they're reading, you know, we're in the first, the Gospel of Matthew, and I was like, ah, what's this? You know, it's like a foreign language. It was The, the uh, words are spelled different, like, like son, and uh, it was really funny to, to, to look at it, but uh, we don't speak uh, uh, English the way, the way they did in 1611 when the King James first came out. So therefore, that's why there's a need for translations. And the English language, and this is a good thing, the English language is changing all the time, uh, and, uh, you know, new idioms are coming about. So that's why there's, people say, why do we need a new translation? Because uh, translations uh, need to come about because, oh, I thought I was waiting for a second. I had my phone on last night. The, uh, the, the, the thing, the reason why we need new translations is because the English language changes. Uh, it changes all the time. So it's probably a good idea every, you know, 30 years to... Uh, on every generation to have a, trend, a new translation. So um, we're going to be talking about the King James, uh, of course, exclusively tonight, and uh, we have a lot of ground to cover. Remember, we have our prayer meeting at the end of uh, service as well. So uh, let's take a moment of silent prayer to get before we get underway, as, as is our custom. We do this so that we can uh, ensure the filling of the Spirit. We examine ourselves to see if we need to confess any sins to the Father. This restores our fellowship with God and the filling of the Spirit. And of course, of co of course they're maintained by uh, bringing our thoughts into obedience to the Spirit. And when we do that, we're being filled with the Spirit, which is commanded of us in Ephesians 5.18. So uh, with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day to gather together to study your word. We thank you for this study that we're pre presently engaged in about the history of the English Bible. And we pray, Father, that it would uh, uh, give your people a greater love and appreciation uh, for their English Bibles that they have in front of them today and to get a great appreciation of the history of the English Bible and the men who gave their lives so that we could have the English, uh, the Bible and translated in our own English language. Of course, as you well know, Father, we have many English translations and no other people in history, no other group of believers in history has had such a plethora of, tr English, of translations in their own language. We're so thankful for this 
And we just thank you for the time and age that you placed us in, in the dispensation of the church age, and in the United States of America, the greatest country in the world still. And we just thank you for the great Bible teaching and the Bible programs and the scholars and scholarship that's in this country. And we just thank you for the great privilege that you've given to us. We pray that we would take advantage of the great privileges that we've been given, the great the responsibilities, therefore, to get your word out, to live in truth, and to communicate it to others. And we just uh, thank you for everyone that is here this evening, and those in the Thompson home, and those who might be viewing or listening to this class uh, through uh, the website at this, at this particular time, live or in the f uh, later date through the recordings, the video and the audio recordings. We thank you for Titus' service with that and this technology, and we pray you give him wisdom in that area. We also thank you for Titus and Jody and their hospitality and opening up their home to us. So, Father, we pray that this, for this class in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Now, as we noted in our study, uh, England, at the, as we, uh, we've been rolling along uh, in this study, we had uh, uh, the morning star of the Reformation, John Wycliffe, some pronounce his name Wycliffe, and he came out with the, uh, the translation of the Bible in English, of the New Testament, and uh, uh, he didn't uh, complete the Old Testament. He died of natural causes, but uh, the men who followed him, the Lollards, uh, they were poor Oxford scholars like he was, and uh, they were uh, great men of God, and they, they translated the Bible into English, and of course, they cost them their lives. Many were burned at the stake. Uh, then we see that uh, by the king of England and, uh, and other kings throughout the, uh, Europe. And then we see that uh, William Tyndale came on the scene. And he was the first one to translate uh, the Bible from the original Hebrew and Greek language. The Bible is written in Hebrew and in in Aramaic in the Old Testament, Greek in the New Testament. And Tyndale was the first one to come up with the translation from those original languages. Whereas Wycliffe, uh, he actually had his translation from the Latin Vulgate, which was an excellent translation produced by a man named Jerome in 400 AD, and it basically was the, uh, the, uh, the translation that the church used uh, for over a thousand years. Uh, remember, the, uh, the, the Greek, of the New, the Greek wasn't no, was no longer spoken really in the empire, except in the eastern half, and so Latin was the language in the Roman Empire, and so Latin became, thus became, uh, the Latin Vulgate thus became very popular and was used all the way up into the 20th century by the Catholic Church. In fact, as they pointed out, the Catholic Mass was still was being uh, spoken in Latin up to the 60s, uh, if I recall correctly. And so uh, uh, Tyndale comes along, and he was a great scholar. He was uh, not only uh, fluent in the, the biblical languages, but he was also fluent in six or seven other languages, and he was great in English as well. He, and this is what makes a great translator, is that they are a scholar in the original language, but also they are excellent in English. And uh, so uh, it's good to, uh, know your, uh, good, to, good to know your English uh, as a translator. You can't be a good translator, translator unless you know the English language. So Tyndale was all of those things. And Tyndale's translation, uh, he didn't yet complete the Old Testament, as we pointed out. Uh, he, he didn't complete the Old Testament, but he went off. He, uh, he went off and uh, did finish the, the New Testament, but as he was in the process of finishing off the Old Testament, he was arrested, betrayed by somebody he befriended, and uh, he was arrested in Antwerp, and he was taken uh, uh, in prison, and he was, uh, uh, he was convicted of heresy for corrupting the Bible, which is kind of, uh, that's uh, uh, ridiculous, because actually he came up with the greatest, one of the great translations of all time in the New Testament. And it, it, you know, so he was executed, and uh, as his, in his dying words, he said, Lord, open the king's eyes. And as that was the king of England's eyes, and as that was why he was being executed, that was actually happening. And, and the king was going about uh, bring a, uh, 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 actually uh, calling for the bishop's Bible, as, as it was later called. So after Tyndale died, uh, we see a, a, a bunch of translations came to the, to the fore. We had... Um, we had the Great Bible that was used, and the Geneva Bible, which was uh, the, the Bible and, that the pilgrims used, and also Shakespeare. So America, basically early America, colonial America, was uh, steeped in the Geneva Bible. And I showed you a little uh, copy of that Geneva Bible last evening for those who were here. So uh, that came about, and then the, uh, well, while all this is going on, these, all this, then the Bishop's Bible came to uh, came about because the church wanted to have a Bible that was for uh, directed to uh, from the uh, uh, the the priest and the uh, the people who were uh, in church leadership in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, the Rames Douay translation came about, and 
which is the Catholic Church's translation. Not they didn't do it because they wanted to get the people uh, into the uh, uh, the translation to their language, the English language. But they wanted the people, if they're going to have a Bible, it better be our Bible, quote unquote. You know, uh, uh, be, basically, listen, read our Bible. Don't read the Protestant Bibles. Read the Catholic Church's Bible. So uh, as we saw, um, the Protestantism, and we saw that with, when Martin Luther. Uh, began right, basically the Reformation by putting 95 complaints on the Wittenberg ch Church in, in Germany, the Roman Catholic Church there. He put 95 complaints up on the church, and this was all a result of, first of all, getting saved as a result of reading his Greek New Testament and Romans in particular. And, and what he's, we see here is that when he did that, when he did that, when he, uh, when he put that, uh, those complaints on the church, what, what it resulted was the Reformation. So there was a bunch of translations that came about because of this. And uh, the Protestants, uh, uh, basically the word Protestants comes from protest. They were protesting against the Catholic Church. Luther was protesting against the Catholic Church because when he read his New Testament, he found out that the church was doing things that were not biblical and they were claiming authority that was not theirs. Uh, Protestantism uh, did, has done more for the translation of the English Bible. In fact, you'd never have an English translation in, at all of the Bible if it wasn't for the Reformers, the Reformation, the Protestants like Tyndale and Wycliffe and men like that and uh, John Rogers. And so we see that uh, uh, the, uh, the, English, uh, the Protestantism is the reason why we have these English translations today. Now, the Catholic Church wanted to suppress the word of God getting out to the people because they wanted to protect their power. Now, the difference between... We would be considered Protestants uh, if you look at the, at the definition because and all evangelicals, anybody who believes that the Bible is the final authority for the Christian and not the Pope or the Cardinal of Co uh, uh, College of cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church, if you believe that the Bible is the Christian's final authority, you would be considered a Protestant. So uh, the Catholic Church, on the hand, believed that the Pope and the Church the, had the final authority, not the Bible. So this was this has created a big problem. It was tremendous. Uh, political upheaval when we have the uh, these English translations coming out by Tyndale, men like that, and Wycliffe. There was tremendous uh, things going on in the world. We had Gutenberg's uh, movable type printing press was invented, changed the world, and of course the first Bible that was printed was the Latin Vulgate, and many were to follow. So uh, the w New World uh, was discovered in 1492 in the midst of this, this tremendous uh, influx of translations, English translations. So we get into this, uh, after Tyndale, as I said before, there was many, several other Bibles, like the Great Bible, they called it, and the Geneva Bible to follow. Uh, these Bibles were simply revisions, really, of Tyndale's uh, in many respects. And Tyndale, uh, we even see, as we'll see this evening, the King James is, is basically another revision of uh, Tyndale's uh, King James, another revision of the of Tyndale's Bible. So, uh, as we noted in our study, England possessed two translations. We left off with this last evening. England, at at, at the at a certain period of time, was possessed two English translations, namely the Bishop's Bible, which is basically the uh, the church hierarchy was behind, and then there was also the Geneva Bible, which was read in people's homes. That was the most popular Bible, the Geneva Bible. As I said before, Shakespeare quoted from it, and the pilgrims read from it, and they brought it to America with them. The Bishop's Bible was not popular, and even the Queen didn't like it as well. Now, we see here that, the again, the Geneva Bible was the most popular, which created a problem for the clergy who needed a translation that uh, their parishioners would love and revere. Now, James VI rescinded, uh, ascended to power, excuse me, after the death of Queen Elizabeth in 1603. He had already ruled Scotland for 37 years when he became King of England. Now, in January of the following year, in 1604, uh, he called a conference of the country's religious leaders at Hampton Court. And what he wanted to do in this conference, the purpose of this conference, was to iron out ecclesiastical differences. So the king actually wanted to have this conference uh, for, to uh, sort out ecclesiastical differences that were taking place in the church. Now, the most important matter which the participants of this conference settled upon was a translation of the entire Bible, which would be based upon the original Greek and Hebrew text and uh, so this was what uh, the king wanted to do, and this is what the, uh, we see that the, the, uh, this conference 
came about with one of the things they wanted to do. Let's get a new translation, a translation, English translation that's based upon the original languages, not the Latin Vulgate. Now, they decided that it would be printed without marginal notes and was only to be used in all the churches uh, in England. So, in, in England, this tr new translation was called, would be called the authorized version. You'll see sometimes in some places where you read uh, certain biblical articles, the, 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 uh, uh, the acronym AV, that's authorized version. And that's uh, the reason why it was, the King James was called the uh, authorized version is because the King, J King James authorized it. So, there's some people out there who think that the King James... Uh, was uh, uh, authorized, and that, that, that means that, that you know that's God has put His seal upon it, and uh, the church had uh, decreed that this is the Bible; it's inspired by God. None of the translations that any English translation, and no translation in any language, is inspired by God. Only a only the original autographs, the Hebrew, Aramaic of the Old Testament, and the Greek New Testament, are inspired by God. And as we pointed out, the King James only advocates out there, and they're everywhere. They say that all these English translations translations are a, uh, a conspiracy, and they only think conspiracy, everything's a conspiracy, except there's no grassy knoll in the, can in the King James. So they have this great conspiracy, and, and that, they, uh, that the, all these modern translations and all these modern scholars like Metzger, they're all undermining the Bible, and, and the King James is the only translation. That's re absolutely ridiculous. How did people get saved uh, before the King James? Uh, I mean, who, I mean, mo, uh, but they what they do is they ascribe biblical passages of of inspiration, not to, uh, to the original languages, but to the King James, which is absolutely ludicrous and terrible exegesis and interpretation. But these people are very dogmatic, and they cause a lot of problems in churches. I've dealt with them, and actually, really, you know, as Paul says, after you've had a, you know. Uh, Second and third warning for a guy who's disruptive and factious, divisive. You don't have anything to do with them. And I've had to deal with certain uh, certain individuals that were King James only guys. And they're the most not all of them, but a lot of them are very divisive, and they cause a lot of problems in churches. And the only way to deal with these guys is very firm, because they're very very stubborn, and they have they're they're uh, sincere, uh, they're sincere but sincerely wrong. So uh, we see, unfortunately. What happened is a lot of people, when it comes to the King James, who are not in agreement with the King James only crowd, they start thinking badly of the King James. And you shouldn't think badly of the King James because there's a group of crazy people out there thinking that it's inspired by God. The King James is actually a great translation for 1611. It's, it's beautiful English, and, it's a part, and every Christian should have one, I think, because it's a part of your English heritage. Your, your, your heritage and uh, as an English-speaking person, so it, because it's a beautiful work of literature. There's nothing like it. And it, it influenced uh, the, even governments in Europe and America for, for centuries. It really has. So in England, this new translation, the King J uh, James VI had uh, wanted, uh, this new translation would be called the authorized version because it was authorized by King James VI. And of course, we call it the King James. Now, the man, because he led the, the, the group in this translation, he didn't translate himself, but he was the one who wanted this translation to take place. Now, the man who pro actually proposed this new translation was Dr. John, uh, Dr. John Reynolds, but it did not meet universal approval. So let me repeat that. The man who proposed this new translation, which became the King James, or the authorized version, was Dr. John Reynolds, but this, uh, the idea of a new translation was, did not meet universal approval. However, the king... King James VI, he approved of it, and that was all that was needed. And then the process, the project was up and running because the king wanted it. Now he had the final say. Now the king, he disliked the Geneva Bible, which ironically had been the official Bible of Scotland during his reign. Now the reason for his hatred of the Geneva Bible was, of course, its notes and not its translation. This is indicated clearly by the fact that he explicitly, King James VI, explicitly mentioned Exodus 1.19, which we've studied, and the Hebrew midwives' disobedience of Pharaoh's edict to murder the infant Jewish baby boys. So therefore, we can see that the motivation for the King James Bible was not just religious or spiritual, but religious and political. So he didn't like the Geneva Bible because of the, the notes, and that's why the Bishop Bible came about, but nobody liked the Bishop's Bible, so now they want to do this King James Bible. And the king, King James VI, didn't like 
uh, the, the notes from the Geneva Bible about Exodus 119 because basically it showed the, the, the Hebrew midwives were practicing justified civil disobedience. So the guy didn't want, I don't want that note in there that you can disobey the king's order. Uh, and even though the, the, the Pharaoh had ordered the murder of innocents, uh, the king, King James VI, didn't want that note in there, giving any people ideas that they could rebel against him and be justified biblically to do so if he gave an order that conflicted with the word of God. So uh, we see that his motivation for this new Bible that was later called the authorized version of the King James was religious, was not simply religious, but political. Now, uh, it's interesting, uh, there's a man named... Uh, 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 Metzger that I've quoted, he's a great scholar, Bruce Metzger is his name, I want to quote from him and Dan Wallace who is uh, one of the, uh, another t great uh, Greek New Testament scholar. Metzger writes, he says in 1603 when King James VI of Scotland became King James I of England, the text of the Bible uh, current in a variety of English translations was a source of division among religious parties in England rather than a bond of unity. In order to reconcile differences among the various parties, the king called for a conference to be held in January 1604 at Hampton Court, as I mentioned earlier. Both bishops and Puritan clergy alike were invited to consult together on the subject of religious toleration. After much inclusive de uh, inconclusive debate, Dr. John Reynolds, president of Corpus Christi College, Oxford, and spokesman for the Puritan party, raised the subject of imperfections of the current English Bibles and proposed that a new or at least the revised translation be made. And uh, we see here that uh, the, uh, if I can skip down, it says, the, uh, there were d it mentions d different difficulties, and he says, the bishops treated the difficulties which they did raise with uh, scorn. They were trivial, old, and often answered. Bishop Bancroft, a stern opponent of the Puritans, raised the objection that if every man's humor were to be to followed, uh, there would be no end of translating. All the conference itself arrived at no conclusion on this or any other subject. King James, who had a personal interest in biblical study and translation, endorsed the idea of a new translation, stating that none of the existing English versions was translated well, and in his opinion, the Geneva Bible was the worst of them all. Whatever his motives, James supported the project so vigorously that by July 1604, a translation uh, committee of some 50 learned men and a list of rules of procedure had been provided, end of quote. Now, Dan Wallace, who, Metzger has uh, gone home to be with the Lord, uh, and uh, Dan Wallace is still with us, thank God. He's a great New Testament scholar, great textual critic, and a theologian. Wallace had this com comment. He writes, it's not altogether unfair to say that the motive to produce this grand work, the King James, was more to protect the status quo than to meet the needs of the people. In this respect, the King James Bible resembled the Roman Catholic Rames Douay version rather than its own Protestant predecessors of the 16th century. And to quote, so what Wallace is saying, the King James is 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 basically uh, continuing the status quo. What he means is that uh, when they had the Geneva Bible, the, the kings didn't like the Geneva Bible because the notes were telling you know people you can. There's justified civil disobedience, and that would undermine the king. So they came up with the Bishop's Bible, and the Bishop's Bible never was popular. People didn't like it, and uh, then they wanted to come up with this new translation, but it was for the king's benefit. It really wasn't for the people's benefit. And so uh, it ended up being a great and popular translation. Now, the king was a major player, as uh, Metzger and, and Wallace point out. The king, King James VI, was a major player in the project as demonstrated by the fact that he even wrote the rules for determining who would be the translators and how they should be organized and the principles that they should follow. Now, uh, I think it was Metzger brought this out King James VI was actually uh, uh, interested in translating itself. So we can't say that he was totally, you know, had bad motivation here. He was interested in translation. And so, and he was a Christian. So many erroneously believed that he actually took part in the translation, but that is emphatically not the case. He had nothing to do with the trans. He was not a translator, but he organized the translator and actually... It was a good, what he did was actually pretty wise. He assigned six panels of scholars who would do the work of translating. There were for three for the Old Testament. Now, these are panels of scholars, okay? Now, there were three for the Old Testament, three panels of scholars, two for the New Testament, as well as one for the Apocrypha. Now, the Apocrypha, you don't see 
You see in some Protestant Bibles, um, but you uh, see them in the Catholic Bibles. And the Apocrypha has like 1st and 2nd Maccabees there, and 3rd uh, uh, Maccabees and uh, Wisdom of Solomon. And of course, when we study canonicity, we'll note that those were never considered by the church to be inspired by God. So uh, the king breaks up these panels of scholars into these teams. Three again for the Old Testament, two for the New, and one for the Apocrypha. Now, two teams of scholars met at Oxford, while two met at Cambridge, and two are at Westminster Abbey. Now, the total number of scholars working on the project was 47. Now, as we pointed out, uh, this is a, a, a good idea. Uh, modern translations today, like the NIV, the Net Bible, the ESV, uh, the uh, Holman's uh, Bible, uh, you name it, they all, are, they, when they translate, they have, they have uh, uh, committees to, that, of scholars that do this. And it's uh, quite interesting. I've read up on these, the committee that uh, was uh, several books on the committee who did the NIV, and I've read stuff about the Net Bible from, from different people. And so it's quite interesting uh, when, they, when they do these things, they have a committee. So it's not just one person doing the translation. That's not to say that one person can't do a great translation. That's evidenced by the fact that Tyndale uh, did a great translation, one man, and basically the King James was another revision of his translation of the, of the New Testament and the Old Testament. So we see that the rules of the translation, the translators were fo to follow, uh, the, rules, the rules that the translators were to follow in doing this King James, the authorized version, was quite interesting. And it's kind of funny, they really didn't follow the rules of the king So that's uh, set down. First, they were to be diligent and basing the translation on the Greek and Hebrew text of the original. But at the same time, retaining the wording of the Bishop's Bible wherever possible. Now, the Bishop's Bible was there to, uh, put out there by the clergy and the, and, the, and, and, and the king to supplant the Geneva Bible, which all the people liked. But the, remember, the, the, lay, the, the clergy and the king didn't like the Geneva Bible because of the notes were not something that they really liked. And why, you know, it's interesting, Geneva Bible... Uh, John Calvin's teaching, and he came, was in Geneva, John Calvin greatly influenced the notes of the Geneva Bible. So uh, it was called the Geneva Bible because it was produced in Geneva, uh, Switzerland. So the rules of the translators were interesting. First of all, they were to be diligent and basing their translation on the Greek and Hebrew text of the original, but at the same time retaining the wording of the Bishop's Bible whenever possible. Now, as I said before, the King James translators they really didn't follow this too well. They weren't, with the King James wouldn't be considered an a accurate translation. It was an elegant translation, meaning they were more out to have, their emphasis was more with good English rather than trying to be as accurate as possible with their translation. It's a tough thing to do. Uh, it's a tough thing to do. And uh, so there, there has to be a balance. And they leaned more toward elegance. And that's the time that they lived in they spoke beautiful English. Secondly, another rule of the translators of the King James was, that, as we noted earlier, was to have no notes, but only those which explain the Greek and Hebrew words or cross-reference other passages. So we have, in our Bibles, uh, modern Bibles, we have cross-references in different verses. So uh, they had that in the King James as well. Interestingly, as I said before, the translators did not follow these rules, especially the first, as I pointed out. Now, the translators, interestingly, they based their work on existing published texts and did not consult any Greek or Hebrew manuscripts when they did a revision. So the textual basis of the Old Testament had not changed dramatically since the 16th century. However, the New Testament had changed quite a bit. What I mean is is that the Old Testament Hebrew text that they had was very stable. It hadn't changed much uh, in, uh, since the 16th century. Meaning, what you had in the Hebrew text was the same thing they had uh, way back in uh, you know, centuries before, back to the first century. But the New Testament, what happened is, uh, the New Testament had um, the, uh, the King James that they the translated off, the King James translated off the Greek text, a handful of Greek texts, and they were not the best texts that we have uh, to, uh, to d today. We have many more. We have thousands, over 5,000 manuscripts uh, and to determine what the original autograph was. Well, they didn't have that. The King James didn't have that plethora or that wealth of uh, witnesses to go back on. Now, that being said, 
even though the King James didn't, wasn't translated off the best manuscripts like we have today, because there's been a lot of discoveries since the King James, it's interesting. There's really not, no fundamental cardinal doctrine of the Christian faith is ever lost, and there's no major, major issues between the, uh, the, uh, the textual apparatus that the, 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 Greek, the, the King James was translated off of with our, the modern apparatus, Greek apparatus that we have today that the modern translations are based upon. So we see here that the textual basis of the Old Testament had not changed dramatically since the 16th century. However, the New Testament had changed quite a bit. Now the King James translators used primarily Stephanus' text of 1550, the third edition, which relied on Erasmus' third edition of 1522, which was the same text that Tyndale employed when making his translation. So what I'm talking about, Stephanus' text, it's a Greek text, Erasmus, it's, a, it's the Greek New Testament. So the translators, they translated off Steph, uh, Stephanus' text, and they relied on Erasmus' third edition of 1522. Now remember about Stephanus, he was the first one who came up with the idea in his Greek New Testament of putting verse divisions in there. Remember the original autographs, uh, one of these, uh, when we do canonicity or, or textual criticism, I'll show you, I'll give you uh, pictures of the, of the manuscripts and, uh, and uh, you know, what a Greek text, would, you know, the Hebrew looks like. You know, the, word, the letters all ran together, and uh, they had no vowel pointings like they have today. With the, uh, the Masoretic text has that. But uh, the Greek New Testament, there was no punctuation. The words all ran together, and they were all in capital letters or uncial letters, we call them, majuscule letters, not, you know, cursive letters. And so it's quite interesting. So we see that uh, uh, Stephanus came by and said, hey, we're going to put uh, verse divisions in here. It was a great idea. And the Geneva Bible was the first one to put verse division, chapter divisions and their Bible. So you could find stuff. It was a great idea. I think St they said Stephanus basically did it while he was on horseback. But I, I find that hard to believe, but you never know. As I said before, uh, reality is often stranger than fiction. Now, the King James Bible was influenced by many translations and not simply the Bishop's Bible. In fact, the Geneva Bible had enormous influence on the King James and in particular the Old Testament books. Now, as I said before, King James, you know what the translate is? Uh, you know, referring back to the uh, the Geneva Bible, he wanted him to refer back to the Bishop's Bible, but they didn't do that because the Geneva Bible was a better translation. It wasn't as wooden or literal, too literal, as the uh, Bishop's Bible. Now, interestingly, in the original preface of the King James, the Geneva is quoted several times and not the King James. And furthermore, the Rames douay translation, the, the Roman Catholic Church's translation, influenced the King James translators as well. The New Testament, the Catholics used, appeared in 1582, while the Old Testament was published only a year or two before the King James. Now, in the preface of the 1611 English version, the translators set their theory of translation. Listen to what they say. They wrote, We have not tied ourselves to an uniformity of phrasing or to an identity of words or some peradventure would wish that we had done because they observe that some learned men somewhere have been as exact as they could, could that way. Truly, that we might not vary from the sense of that which we had translated before, if the words signify the same in both places, for there be some words that be not of the same sense everywhere. So if the words signify the same in both places, we were especially careful and made a conscience uh, conscious, uh, con uh, made a conscious according to our duty. But that would we, we should express the same notion in the same particular word. As for example, if we translate the Hebrew or Greek word once by purpose, never to call it intent. If one were jour we're journeying, uh, journeying, never traveling. If one were think, never suppose. If one were pain, never ache. If one were jo wear joy, never gladness, etc. Thus to mince the matter, we thought to savor more of curiosity than wisdom, and that rather would breed scorn in the atheist than bring profit to the godly reader. End of quote. Uh, now, if I could, uh, Dan Wallace has a quote about uh, this King James here in the translation. And let me read it uh, 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 to you. Wallace writes, at Oxford University, uh, at Oxford University is a manuscript, he said, that gives us a fascinating glimpse into the translation work 
almost behind the scenes, as it were. The manuscript is a copy of the Gospels from the Bishop's Bible that was used by the translators through various stages of revision. You can detect the various groups that work the document over. Handwritten notes mark up almost every verse of the text. Now, let me interject something. I'm gonna, uh, he's saying something quite interesting here with, about the King James translators, which is going to debunk the idea of the King James only crowd. He goes on to say, Wallace, the first team made their revision, notice, revision, marks by hand, completing the work within a relatively short period of time. And then he said, had the King James appeared in 1608, when the first revision of the whole Bible was virtually completed, and it would have looked substantially like a revision of the Bishop's Bible, but more work needed to be done. Then the manuscript was sent to a final revision committee, and they marked up the text still further. One of the most fascinating aspects of the work is that as the manuscript went through the, its stages of revision, the new version kept looking less and less like the bishop's Bible, which the king wanted, and more and more like Tyndale. End of quote. Now, notice the revision. Uh, the, uh, he keeps mentioning they worked on the revision, which is a great idea. The, I mean, that's what happens with translation committees. And I, I, when I'm translating, I'm always tweaking the, the translation. It takes a while to get, it, get the translation the way you want it. And so they were, the, the, tra the translators of the King James, they were going through m many revisions. And in fact, as we'll see, once it was published, it was already editing going on to do it again, to e revise it again because of mistakes in printing or whatnot, or they didn't like a translation of a certain area. So that debunks the idea that the King James is inspired by God. Uh, you know, when, when the human author, when Paul wrote Colossians and the original autograph, you know, he wasn't making revisions. You know, there was no revisions. Uh, there was, uh, he wrote it and he sent it off the letter and was inspired by God. Perfect. In the original autograph. Well, the King James crowd seems to think that their translation, the King James, is inspired by God. Well, if that's the case, what, what is the, why did the King James translators themselves feel the need to edit their own work? Because that's what they did. That's a fact. We know that from what we see, and what they left behind for posterity. Now, the King James Bible is therefore really the fifth revision of Tyndale, since it greatly influenced, it was greatly influenced by the Geneva and Tyndale translation. So as I said before, William Tyndale, who, who died for his, translating the Bible, his translation was so good, I mean, he, he coined these words like redemption, Passover, even the adjective beautiful. That's him. He was brilliant. He was a genius. And the translators of different Bibles, including the King James for centuries, they basically were revising Tyndale's work because it was so good. They find themselves going back to what Tyndale did. So, in fact, as I also pointed out, I think it was last night or two nights ago, 90% of the King James New Testament was actually Tyndale's translation. But in defense of the King James translators, they did rigorously work over the translation and produce an entirely new work, as Wallace pointed out. There are many places where they sacrifice Tyndale's accuracy for a more elegant translation. So as I pointed out before, the King James translators, they did a great job. It was, they were more in line with beautiful English, great flowing English, and that's why it's so memorable. A lot of the modern translations are not as memorable as the King James uh, because they weren't, you know, they weren't, they, these modern translations are trying to do that, but uh, they don't quite, they're not as quite as memorable as the King James was in its, in its time. But they've sacrificed accuracy, the King James translators, to get really nice English. And Tyndale, uh, he didn't do that. He, he, he was very conscientious about being accurate. So that, again, when you translate, it's kind of like, uh, it's a very fine line. It's a difficult job uh, to, to be a translator. Now, the primary principle of the King James translators was not faithfulness to the Greek text, but rather elegance in English, as I said before. They also followed uh, the Protestants in regards to the Apocrypha by placing it at the end of the Old Testament. And so these books are the, called the Apocrypha, which we're going to study when we get to canonicity which follows this study of the history of the English Bible, we're going to see that the, uh, the Apocrypha, uh, the Protestants, they placed it at the end of the Old Testament. Uh, that with King James translators, they followed the Protestants and their Bibles in putting the Apocrypha uh, at the end of the Old Testament. 
Now, the Roman Catholics, they think it's the Apocrypha is inspired by God. If you look at a, a Jerusalem Bible, a Catholic Bible, Jerusalem Bible, I got one in my library, and it's, it contains the Apocrypha. I think that uh, some Protestant Bibles have the Apocrypha, and they put it at the end of the Old Testament, and, like the New Revised Version has it. I know that. Uh, I know that for a fact. Now, the King James was originally published with mar many marginal notes. There were actually 6,500 that appeared in the Old Testament, while the Apocrypha had 1,000 notes, and the New Testament possessed 800. Thus, we can see that there were 8,500 notes total in the King James. Now, you got to remember, most of these notes, though, indicated textual variants, but a great number explained to the reader where the translators were undecided as to the meaning of the original. When I say textual variant, uh, those are, uh, in certain manuscripts, uh, when you look at a passage like, uh, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his newly born son, there's uh, some manuscripts may, might read it a little bit different, not changing the thought, but uh, having certain words in certain order or not having certain words. And so uh, anytime one manuscript, Greek manuscript, differs from another Greek manuscript in any way, it's counted as a variant. Uh, even if it's a misspelling of a word, and it's an obvious misspelling. You know, we have this in emails and stuff and letters, and we, we read somebody's, you know, um, email, and you, and you say, oh, you know, they, mis they, they misspelled here. But we know what they meant. We know what they still meant, but it was, it's, it's, they, we can see the error, but it's clear what the error was and what they left out. So we see that uh, the King James translators, they would say, they would point out to you, and their notes that there was a variant here, and they weren't really sure of what it should be translated for sure. Now, uh, in uh, the Net, Net Bible, they have great notes, and they'll tell you, uh, they'll get actually a really good way of teaching people about this, what scholars do. They do a great job of teaching both lay people and educating the scholar or the, the pastor. So uh, we see that there was 8,500 notes total in the King James. And uh, the preface, interestingly, contained a note from the translators to the reader, which expressed their conviction that their translation, the King James, was not inspired by the Holy Spirit, and that they knew future discoveries of manuscripts would help to clear up the meaning of the original text. Now, sadly, this preface is no longer printed in the King James Bible. And uh, this glaring omission of not having this preface from the translators who acknowledge that their translation is not inspired by God and that other dis manuscript discoveries in the future would shed light on ex the accuracy of a certain passage, what it actually reads. They, this clearing omission of not uh, putting this preface in the King James Bible is one of the big reasons why some believe that the King James is the only inspired translation that is perfect and inerrant. So, uh, we see that F.F. Uh, Bruce writes, some people would prefer a false appearance of certainty to an odd, uh, honest admission of doubt. Now, these same Christians who are of the conviction that the King James is inspired by God are ignorant, are ignorant of the fact that following the translation of the King James, and I mentioned this before, a great deal of research and discovery has helped scholars to understand more clearly the original text. So, what I'm saying is, since the, the King James was, trans, the New Testament, they translated off a handful of manuscripts. And what's interesting, too, they were missing uh, parts of Revelation at the end, I think it was. And so what they did is they back-translated Revelation, meaning they didn't have the Greek text for it, part of it. So what they did is they went off the Latin Vulgate. And they try to translate, uh, figure out, the, they get the Latin Vulgate, and they try to figure out what the Greek was that the Latin Vulgate, from the Latin Vulgate, figure out what the Greek was. So that and brought into all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of crazy things. So the King James tr uh, translators, they didn't have the manuscripts that we have today that our modern translations are based upon. Uh, we have, and we'll study this in the basics of textual criticism, uh, we, we have a, a, an embarrassment of riches uh, for instance, the New Testament, the amount of copies of manuscripts that we have, when we compare it to other works of antiquity and other histories, uh, we see that the, the New Testament has, uh, has a, 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 ten, a, hundred, a thousand times more witnesses, more manuscript copies than the great works of history, which we never, ever question uh, at all their textual base. But the New Testament has ex an, an exceedingly superior textual base than those ancient uh, works of history. 
You know, we, for instance, uh, some uh, some works we have copies of uh, uh, copies of the original a thousand, two thousand years after the original autograph. Whereas the New Testament we have within a hundred years. In fact, we might even have a, a we have one at Gospel of John, which is at the beginning at the second century, or maybe at the end of the first century. So you're talking about within fifty years of the gospel, the gospels were, uh, well, the Gospel of John within ten years of the Gospel of John, or fifty years. So that no other work of antiquity can make that claim. And so we have a superior uh, textual uh, 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 wealth of manuscripts to, that our New Testament is based upon. So what I'm telling you is the King James was translated off a handful of manuscripts. Today, all the modern translations, they, they all have access to over 5,000 of these manuscripts, uh, whether they're Greek papyri, or uh, Uncials, capital letters, all capital letters, or the, which came, a, uh, came after there. And then you had the, the minuscules, minuscules. Uh, they were uh, cursive letters, and those came much later. And so we have all these manuscripts. All, we have copies of uh, the, the, the early church fathers. In fact, if all the copies of the New Testament were lost, we, could find, we know the, what the New Testament is from just their writings that we have copy of. Many times over, we could figure out the New Testament just from their writings because they quote the New Testament all the way through the early church fathers. And the early church fathers came after the apostles in the second and third century. So we'll talk about this in textual criticism when we get to it. But the King James, they didn't have this kind of... And so the translators were like, we know there's going to be more discoveries in the future, so uh, those discoveries are going to help us to pinpoint what the original autograph was. So uh, we see here that the, these... Uh, the King James crowd, the King James only crowd, they're ignorant of these things, what the translators said about their own translation. Consequently, because of this, translations must always be updated to keep up with new archaeological manuscript discoveries. Furthermore, many King James advocates only, uh, King James only advocates are also ignorant that, the, as I said before, that the preface of the first edition of the King James had the following statement. Now listen to what the, the translators of the King James said of their own Translation. Remember, the King James only advocates today say that the King James is inspired by God, inerrant, and it's the only true translation. We can't read from any other Bible. All right? Which is kind of interesting. And before I read it, think about this. How did people get saved? When they didn't, I mean, can people get saved without the King James? Absolutely. I get saved without even knowing a Bible. Somebody told me about Jesus and I got saved. I didn't even read a Bible. That was till after. So, you know, the, the King James crowd is like saying, oh, you can only get saved through the King James. But are all these people who get, sa uh, get saved without a Bible, somebody who evangelized them, or they got uh, saved by reading the NIV or the Net Bible or the New American Standard? What are they going to say to those guys? That they're not saved? It's how irrational and illogical. And really, uh, they're, they, it's basically a, um, a psychological, really, weakness is what it is. Uh, they are... They're a very interesting uh, crowd. So uh, here's what the King James translators said in the preface about their translation. He sa they said, to those who point out defects in the translator's works, they answer that perfection is never attainable by man. But the word of God may be recognized in the very meanest translation of the Bible, just as the king's speeches, speeches, uh, speech addressed to parliament remains the king's speech when translated into other language, than that in which it was spoken, even if it not be translated word for word, and even if some of the renderings are capable of improvement. To those who complain that the translators have introduced so many changes in relation to the older English version, they answer, speaking about themselves, by expressing surprise that revision and correction should be imputed as false. The whole history of Bible translation in any language, they say, is a history of repeated revision and correction, end of quote. So that ref the King James translators would laugh at these King James only crowds today. They would say, you've got to be kidding me. No English translation is inspired by God. Only the original autographs were. And we only have copies of those today. And of course, we have co those copies. We have enough copies and we can determine the, the, the text of the New Testament and the Old Testament. But these King James only advocates are saying that the King James is, in is inspired by God. But that's not what the translators said of their own translation. They said it's, infa it's fallible. It's not perfect. So Dan Wallace has an interesting comment. He has a few observations I think you would find interesting. 
He says, and I'm quoting from him, a few observations on this statement of what the translators of the King James said about their own translation. He said, a few observation, observations on this statement are in order. One, the translators do not equate their work with the inspired word of God. They explicitly deny the perfection of the King James. Number two, they freely admit that even the worst translation of Scripture is still to be regarded as the Word of God. Number three, they make a qualitative distinction between the text written in one language and the translation of it in another. Regarding Scripture, they admit that only the original text in Greek and Hebrew was inspired. They implicit, number four, they implicitly approve all later revisions of their work, their own work, because the very nature of Bible translation involves a history, as they say, of repeated revision and correction. Sadly, many today who are King James only, quote unquote, advocates, would deny all four of these points. Their only excuse for doing so is that they have never read the text of the translators to the reader. But just a few years ago, that preface became available as a separate book published by the American Bible Society. It includes both the old wording as well as the updated version, along with a full commentary, end of quote. And I'll, get you, I'll guarantee you that the King James only advocates, they would say, ah, conspiracy. They just wrote this. They just, they, this is all a bunch of baloney. They just put that out there just to shut us all up. So that's how people are today. They think there's a conspiracy with everything. Listen to me. If there's no evidence and witnesses for conspiracy, there's no conspiracy. If you have evidence and witnesses for it, okay. But we, in our country, we think there's a conspiracy of everything. It's absolutely ludicrous. We live in a, we, our country is insane. It's really insane what has happened. Now, that, does that, do I, do I think there's no such thing as translation, uh, translations, no such thing as uh, um, conspiracies? Of course I know there's conspiracies. In fact, uh, the greatest one the Bible says is started by Satan. So, end of discussion. All right? So, when the King James Bible was first published in 1611, we'll come to the close, come to the end here. When the King James Bible was first published in 1611, it was not universally received since many Roman Catholics rejected it. The preface of the King James, though, anticipated this by rejecting the Rames Douay translation of the Roman Catholic Church. They wrote, the Catholics have the purpose to darken the sense that although they must needs translate the Bible, yet by the language thereof it may be kept from being understood. But we desire that the scripture may speak like itself, that it may be understood even by the very vulgar, end of quote. Now, again, it brings out something I pointed out before. When I grew up, when I grew up this is what they told me as a Catholic. You can't understand the Bible. Uh, it's... Uh, it's it's, you know, beyond your understanding. The priest you got to help you to do it. The churches help you understand it and everything. Of course, they never taught scripture. They never taught, I mean, they do readings. They'd read something from the Gospel of John every Sunday or whatever. And a lot of times it'd be the same reading every year. You could, on, on the exact day, you knew it'd be the same reading every time. But they never explained what it said. They never had any exposition of the scriptures. And they, they basically kept it from the people. Well, when I uh, started talking to some of my friends who were Protestants, they tell me about Jesus, I got saved, and next thing I know, I'm reading the Bible, and you know, I could read the Bible for myself, especially when you have the gift of the Spirit, and you received at conversion. So uh, what the translators of the King James are saying is that the Catholics, in their translation, they're trying to keep the, what the Word of God says to the people. They're trying to obscure it from the people, or tell the people it's beyond your understanding. You know, you people just can't figure it out. You're not smart enough, something like that. Now, another reason why the King James was not universally received was inaccuracies. Uh, Dr. Hugh Broughton, who was a first-class Hebrew scholar, pointed out, and I'm quoting from him, the late Bible was sent to me to censure, which bred in me a sadness that will grieve me while I breathe. It is so ill done. Tell his majesty that I had rather be rent in pieces with wild horses than any such translation by my consent should be urged upon poor churches. The new edition crosseth me. And he's speaking old English. I require it to be burnt. End of quote. And this, brought out, this brings out something. This guy's response to the King James back, and he was a scholar back in the King James day, 1611. That's what happens when anybody comes up with a new translation. Burn it. You always have these nuts out there. You're going to burn this translation. They did that with the NIV. When the, new, when the revised standard version came out, what, when we talk about that in the, in the next, uh, next week, people went berserk because they, did, they translated certain things that 
what do you, you know, the idea of virgin, they translated young woman. Uh, and, and, and people went berserk. You're denying the virgin birth. They weren't denying the virgin birth. They were being scholastically honest. The word says young woman. That, uh, translating it young woman and virgin, you know, the Isaiah passage, you'd be born of a virgin, that doesn't change the doctrine of the virgin birth. The virgin birth is not based upon one passage. But these people, you know, you can't, sometimes you just can't speak to these people. They're just out of their minds. And so uh, translating the Bible, you can be, uh, um, I remember I translated something that was in Genesis or something, and this guy wrote me, a, wrote me an, uh, an email, and he, was, uh, he didn't know what he was talking about. And I was like, so I had to be very patient with him, but I, it soon occurred to me that this guy didn't want to learn anything. He just wanted to go and spout off about it. He wasn't listening to what I was going to say. He was just talking for his own, hearing his own voice. So when people are like that, I don't even bother talking to them because they just like to hear their own voice. They don't want to talk about Debate, uh, discuss it, they want to just say what they have to say. They don't care what you have to say. So uh, this rejection by Dr. Hugh Broughton of the King James, however, could have been from resentment, it's interesting, at not being picked to be on the translation committee, which he was more than qualified for. So one of the reasons why he might not have been too happy about the King James is because he wasn't asked to be on the committee. And for good reason, he was a pain in the rear. He was very difficult to work with. And remember, the King James was done by committee. So uh, he, was, uh, he was probably not overlooked by accident. Now, the King James really never had a first printing since the revision and correction pro progress or process had already immediately begun in 1611 and even before the first printed edition was completed and assembled together. Don't miss that. The King James, soon it was, soon as it was done, the correction process was already immediately beginning. Amazing. Amazingly, the actual first edition and the corrected second edition appeared to be accidentally mixed before they were assembled and bound. <laughs> the King James also went through at least two more revisions in the first year alone. In fact, not only this, but it actually went through 14 minor editions due to the frequent mistakes and the process of translating, revising, and printing. So remember this, when a King James-only guy comes around or her, and they start spouting off about this. You said, well, you know, and be gentle. Just say, well, all due respect, uh, historically speaking, we know that the King James went through many revisions. <laughs> it went through 14 minor editions due to the frequent mistakes and the process of translating, revising, and printing. So this was followed by two massive revisions in 1629 and 1638. So the King James couldn't be inspired by God because look at all the revisions and editions that were taking place. In the end, there were almost 10,000 changes made to the original 1611 King James Bible. Most of, the most of these changes were minor involving spelling and punctuation. This makes clear that those King James advocates are clearly in the wrong by ignorantly claiming we read only the original 1611 King James Version of the Holy Bible. The King James is not the only Bible which is imperfect. Since every translation ever made is imperfect, including the one I give you of my own, it's imperfect because I'm, this is the, only the original autographs are inspired by God. Uh, we can, oh, we're not, uh, our work is not perfect. So the, the, that means the RSV, the NRSV, the New American Standard, the NIV, today's NIV, the ESV, the Net Bible, and my translation, they're all imperfect. Because no translator is perfect. Now, why is that? Well, the more knowledge you have, the better, uh, better, uh, 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 the more um, com better command that you have of the English language, the better translator you would be. So, some people are, are more skilled in the original autographs and, and uh, original Greek and Hebrew, and skilled in English, so they make a better translation than other guys do. So, it, uh, so nobody is perfect in their translation. The King James, none of the modern translations, nobody has an inspired translation. S despite its shortcomings, and we'll close with this. And I've spoken some things about the King James only crowd, not the King James Bible itself. The King James, despite its shortcomings, is the greatest monument to the English language, and it has endured the test of time. The elegance of the translation in the King James is unparalleled. We, the, the translators today are trying to capture today in English, uh, this, what the King James did in 1611. But they've never, no one's been able really to do what the King James did 
with the elegance of translation. Translators are today trying to get elegance of translation and accuracy, but nobody's really, I don't think, has done that. Now, it, uh, the King James, and we close with this, the King James has had tremendous influence upon Western civilization. Uh, and it should be in the library. The King James should be in the library of every Christian, every uh, Christian speaking Eng who speaks English for the simple reason that it is a part of their rich literary and relig religious heritage. So uh, the King James, though, you know, we're not going to use that as a Bible today to study from or take the Bible class. We don't speak the language, we don't speak the English of the King James in 1611. English has changed so much. I like to bring this out. You take the word gay today. I mean, the gay in 1611 meant you were happy. Now it means you're a homosexual. I mean, how many people use, oh, I'm gay, when you know, I'm, having, I'm happy? Nobody says I'm happy and, say, and uses the word gay to say that because they, they know immediately the connotation attaches you're a homosexual or you're saying you're a homosexual. English has changed so much, so many words. Uh, look at the, 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 the Geneva Bible. How the word son is translated. You know, you have an F in there and stuff. It's like, but things have changed so much in the English language from the English of 1611 of the King James to today's English. Uh, we, 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 you read, I've read some of the quotes from the King James translators tonight. You're probably like, how did they, what? You know, even I'm reading this stuff and it's like, mm, that's interesting. Uh, one of them said uh, something kind of funny. He was like saying, uh, oh, what was he saying? It was pretty funny. Oh, uh, vulgar. You know, yeah, the people who are very, talking about people who are vulgar. Uh, he wasn't talking about vulgar and in, in meaning rude. He was talking about the lower classes of people. So we use words in English different ways than we did 300 years ago. Thus the need for new translations. We need new translations because the English language changes all the time. So that's why people say, why do we need another new translation? Because the English language is changing. Also, the other reason is, and we'll wrap this up with this, we're learning more about the original text. Every year, we're learn scholars are learning more and more new things, and it's, we're, the, we're the ones that are going to benefit from it. So you and I should be, thank God, that we're living in a day and age in America where we have a plethora, many English translations to choose from. Whereas back in 1611, what do they have? They didn't have many. King James, Geneva Bible, Bishop's Bible, wasn't very much. You know, they, they weren't anything compared to what we have today. The translations are, are superior today in accuracy uh, than the, the translations you know, 300, 400, 500 years ago. Well, you've been a great audience, and hope you, hopefully you, this uh, educated you a bit about the King James and about the history of our English Bible. So let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would encourage us with what we've heard and give us a greater appreciation for the Bibles that we have in front of us here in America in English in the 21st century. In our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, we'll have our prayer meeting.